Well, good evening, everyone. Good evening. And good evening, Internet. God bless you again for being with us tonight. I want you to stand, please. Turn to page number 87, little pink book. Little pink book. Tell it I must. If you got it, you got to tell it. Number 87. I'm happy in Jesus, my Savior. I must, for He has redeemed me. I know my sins were like crimson, my heart was defiled. He washed me as white as the snow. I'm singing because I am free. And Jesus is reigning in me. Hallelujah, I'm happy. Since in him I trust and sing it and tell, keep singing. I'm filled with the Spirit and washed in the blood. King Jesus is living in me. The glory of heaven beams down on my way. I'm sanctified, happy, and free. I'm singing because I am. Hallelujah, I'm happy since in him I trust and sing it and tell it. I keep singing. Sometimes I am tempted by Satan and sin. Sometimes I am weary and worn. But even in my darkness, God's promise is true. And gladness returns with the Lord. I'm singing. I am free, and Jesus is reigning in me. Hallelujah, I'm happy since I'm here. My trust in singing and telling I must keep singing. So onward I travel through heaven above, through glory or sadness or dream. By faith in His promise I'll live for. And sing till the clouds disappear. I'm singing because I am free. We're going to sing that verse again pretty soon. This is living in me. Hallelujah. I'm happy since in him I trust. And sing it. Sing that last verse one more time. That's really good. So onward I travel to heaven above. Glory or sadness so free. How about by faith in his promise I live for the Lord and sing till the clouds disappear. I'm singing because I am free, and Jesus is reigning in me. Hallelujah, I'm happy since in my trust and sing. standing please Amen. <clears throat> I am raining sweetly raining All right. far above this world's strife yeah. how you doing it brother Gayhart? in my blessed loving Savior yes. <laughs> I am raining out in the middle Amen. <laughs> <laughs> no we don't have to wait to the millennium. We can read in this life Amen. by one Christ Jesus. Came. Praise the Lord. Yes. When he saves us, he sets up his kingdom in our hearts, sets on our hearts strong, and lives the life. We can live the life with him living within us. Thank the Lord for Jesus Christ and all he's done for all of us. Yes. Well, everybody, welcome tonight. We enjoyed a wonderful service this morning for yes, which we yes. give praise. And I know Brother Yoder gives God praise for it also. Uh, Internet, if you're looking on, welcome. We hope to give you a good service again tonight. But we have several burdens. Wherever there is...
is a church meeting, if they're living the way they should be, there's lots of burdens. So this morning, some of these will be repeat, but that will be okay. We want to remember Sister Donna Bartlett. Uh, we want to remember Sister Loretta. She just got out of rehab, I think, so we want to remember her as she recover. Uh, evidently, Hoss had his surgery, is that correct? So we want to remember Hoss Nethers as he recovers from this foot surgery. Uh, Brother Gauzes, do remember Brother and Sister Gauzes. They've served God faithfully for many, many years. And now they are down. For some time out in the future, they're going to cross over, which each and every one of us will do. Yep, that's true. So let's pray earnestly for them that God will give them good days as they come close to end, ending their journey. Okay, uh, we have other requests here. Uh, we want to remember Brother Wright back here. I just can't get over Brother Wright. I really can't. This man had cancer treatment this week on Tuesday. And it about does him in whenever he has it on Tuesday. He has a real rough week that first week, and then the second week before he has the next treatment, uh, he feels a little better. But how many of us would I get out to the house of God Amen. and be in the condition that he is? I'm sure God looks down and is well pleased with Brother Wright. Continue to remember him. And let's uh, remember uh, Brother Warner in prayer. Uh, let's see. Brother Tony, help me out here. Okay, yes. We certainly want to remember Brother Paul. Sister Mandy, they have a strep throat. Uh, how did the youth service go out to Flint Ridge? I don't, Sister Mary, how did the youth service go? Good. Good. Uh, the first and third Sunday of the month, the youth go out to Flint Ridge to minister to those old people. And Vivian and I went many years, and I used to say to Vivian, we're going out to minister to the old people today. She say, Ruben? We are old people ourselves. <laughs> so thank God for the ministry, Sister Mary, Brother Chad, and the others that are involved in that. Is there anything I'm missing? Let's remember Brother Yoder tonight that will be bringing the Word of God to a short choir practice Tuesday night. Oh, yes, and cookies. Uh, the young people are selling cookies again this year uh, for their trip to Guatemala. There's uh, sign-up sheets out there that you can sign up to order so many uh, cookies. It's a worthwhile project. They've been done other things like raking leaves and had a church dinner, and they will be having an activity each month to raise money to go to Guatemala. I think there's 10 or 12, something like that, going. So I'm going to ask my good brother, Brother Bruce, here. I've learned to love. Brother Bruce and his family and all of you out. Brother Bob. My brother in law, uh, Walter Frank, he asked me to bring five pieces back church. Okay. Okay, let's do remember this request. And Brother Bruce, if you would please come and lead us to the throne. Brother Gayhart, let's remember um, the Lancaster Church. Okay, the Lancaster Church. Uh, uh, if I understand correctly, Brother Tony, Brother Steve has resigned down to Lancaster, and no doubt they will be looking for another minister. So let's remember them. Brother Bruce. Let's pray. Dear Most Precious Holy Father, Lord, we do thank you, dear God, Lord, Father, for another opportunity to uh, come to your throne. Yes. Lord, uh, uh, truly you are a great God, and we have much to thank you for and, and to praise you for, Lord God. Uh, we think of how we've just uh, passed through this Thanksgiving season and help us, Lord Father, not to just give thanks on, a, on a, one day, but Lord, each and every day, Lord Father, that we can look up to you and realize where our blessings come from and, and truly you are too good to us, Lord Father, more than we deserve, Lord. And we just want to thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. We we thank you for 
the opportunity to enter into his service. We know that there are millions in this world that, uh, that would just love to congregate freely and, and have a, a church to go to without fear of persecution. And, and even in our own land, how, how so uh, few a church is, Lord, Father, uh, meet on, on Sunday night, Lord God, and, and people are so involved in this world. We're just thankful that we have a refuge here, Lord, Father. We can gather together with our brothers and sisters and, and worship you, Lord God, and, and hear a message to have our, our souls fed and to have our souls challenged, dear God. And, and we pray, Lord, uh, Lord, that it will be so again tonight, Lord Father, that you would just be in this service, yes. that you would help the choir as they sing and, and use them, Lord Father, any specials, and uh, especially as Brother Yoder stands before us. Lord, we know that he's put time in to, and studied, and, and Lord, he's, he's uh, sought your face. And we pray, Lord, that you would just make speaking easy for him tonight, Lord Father, that you would just use him again, Lord Father, in a special way. We ask that you'd be at the many requests. We know that we won't remember them all, but Lord, we're thankful that we serve a God that, that knows each and every detail of our lives. And Lord, you're, uh, you love us so, dear Father, Lord God. And, and we pray, Father, that you would be with the ones that have lost loved ones. We think of the, the Blackwell family, Lord, as they, they mourn the loss of this, uh, this son and father. And we pray, Lord God, that you would just be with them and comfort their hearts, Lord. And, uh, also, I uh, think of Loretta Wood and, and others that, uh, that, are, that have needs and the ones that have come through surgery. We're thankful, Father, for being with these ones, and we pray that you would help them in their recovery, that it will be a speedy recovery, that they can get up and back to their uh, daily routine and, and, and way of life. Uh, we ask, Lord, for uh, the, the church there at Lancaster. And, and Lord, we pray, Father, that you would just guide them in their search for a new pastor. Uh, we pray that you'd be with Brother Steve. Bless him, Lord, Father, as he, uh, as he moves on, Lord, that you would just continue to use him. And we ask, Lord, Father, for uh, each and every other request, Lord, Father, that we failed to remember. Uh, and we ask it all in your most precious name. Amen.
While we take our evening offering, turn to page number 13, same little book. Number 13, I love him. That's probably not a take an offering song, but I want to say it. Gone from my heart, world, all its strife. Gone from my heart, the Justin has a song before the message tonight. So thankful for what we experienced this morning. How many were here this morning? Are you thankful? That's what I called an old fashioned. Holy Ghost filled message and service and time together with the saints of God. I was thinking about that song we sing in the choir about that old time religion. <laughs> That's what I think about when I think about that old time religion, the sweet, sweet presence of Almighty God. And it's my desire to serve Him. He's done so much for me. Can you pray for me as I sing this song? It's 
my desire to live for Jesus it's my desire to I failed him and caused much shame, and it's my desire. desire to help someone today someone who may have failed failed to find the way for I too was once so lost, but I found my way to God, and it's my desire. brought me from and where I am today then you would know the reasons why I love him so and you can take this world and all its riches I don't need earth's faith it's my desire to live for him think about it if you Brother Ba, if you could see where my Jesus, he brought me from, and where I am today, oh, then you would know the reasons why I love take this world and all its riches I don't need her's fame it's my desire it's my desire yes it's my desire
That was what Brother Yoder was talking about this morning. To be like Jesus. To walk in his footsteps. Thank the Lord we can do that by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that he gives. We can do all things, Paul said, didn't he? I can do all things. Not just a few things, not just some things, but I can do all things through Christ, which strengthened me. Well, it's my privilege tonight to introduce Brother Yoder. My mind goes back. Brother Yoder, you'll have to fill in the ears. 50 years or so, 45, 50 years ago, the old camp meetings down to God's Acres there, spring camp meeting, winter camp meeting, fall camp meeting, and usually I can remember, especially in the 40, 50 year range, Brother Yoder being one of the evangelists, Brother Farmer being one of the evangelists. Brother Harold Kelly, he came in, was one of the evangelists. Of course, Brother Wilson was one of the evangelists. And Oh, it does my heart good. I can still see that old bar. You remember the flaps that came down and the building would be full, brothers and sisters. The building would be full. And outside, where they lifted up the doors and so forth. People would be looking in and trying to see what was going on inside that old barn. Oh, thank the Lord. Amen. Thank the Lord. And you know, Jesus is the same today, Amen. yesterday, and forever. He can bless us just here in the present time, just like he blessed us there. Brother Yoder has been Sister Yoder. I don't want to leave her out. Has been faithful down through the years. Been through the old ship of Zion. Been through many rough waters. But God, Jesus, has always been at the helm. Guiding and bringing up to the present point. Now just a few more days. When Jesus comes back after us, but we know it's going to be something glorious. We're because we're going to see him as he is. See him as he is. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for eternal life. Thank God for the brother. And thank God for Brother Yoder. I'm running out of words, Brother Yoder. Come on. Thank God again. Anchor has held down through years. Thank the Lord, all the all the praise and the honor and the glory for whatever any of us do belong to Him. I thank God that that uh, He has, well, He has blessed my life, <laughs> and uh, I, I got saved when I was seventeen. The only regret I have is I wish I'd have got saved earlier. I was I was uh, brought up in a in a home where we didn't go to church, <clears throat> and my father was an alcoholic. In fact, you've heard me say it, most of you anyway, that he drank himself to death. He died at the age of 51. He uh, uh, had cirrhosis of the liver and large heart. But thank the Lord, he got saved a short time before. He went home to be with the Lord. But God has blessed my life. He's blessed my life. I don't know about you, but uh, the Bible speaks about being favored by the Lord. I've, had, I've got some thoughts here that I jotted down, but I don't know which way to go tonight. But uh, I'm going to start off by just giving a testimony to God and for what he has done for me. I, first of all, I want to thank you, Brother Bartlett, for the opportunity to come here. Uh, I count you as a friend, not just a ministerial brother, 
but as a friend, and i thankful for the opportunity. In fact, as the Apostle Paul said, I thank God that he counted me faithful and called me into the ministry. I, I, I believe that God calls us. We don't, we don't choose the ministry as a profession, but God calls us. And when I, after I was saved, I was saved in October uh, 1955, the last Sunday of October 1955. And uh, then that winter, uh, our, our family did not have a car. And I went to church uh, with the neighbor, and the uh, church was uh, eight or ten miles away. And uh, I would go down there, and uh, they lived about a half a mile away from where we did in the hills of Kentucky. And then I would ride to church with them. And the Brother Odoe step, he'd gone on to be with the Lord many years ago, but he was a, a real help to me, as, uh, especially his wife, uh, Sister Thelma E. Step. I... I uh, I got, she was my mentor spiritually and started me off on the right way and doing the right thing. But Brother Odo had a job away. He worked out of state. And uh, so on Sunday afternoon, he would leave. And uh, we didn't have any way to go to church. So Sister East Step, they had a, they had a, what we called at that time a cottage prayer meeting, which was simply a prayer meeting in their home. And, and I went to that, and there were several people there, maybe 18 or 20, uh, gathered in their living room, and a young preacher was preaching, and uh, they brought a chair out of the kitchen, put it in the middle of the living room, and uh, used it as, a, as an altar. And I remember after, during that service where they were singing the invitation song, I felt a real need in my heart. I mean, I just, I just, uh, I felt a need. And so I went there to pray and uh, I knelt down to pray. And as I knelt down to pray, uh, Paul Estep, which was uh, Odell's son, one of his sons, knelt down at that chair beside me. Well, I'd been praying for Paul to get saved ever since I'd gotten saved. So I forgot about my need, and I began to pray for him. And uh, he, got, he got wonderfully saved. I mean, he, he come up uh, happy and went around the room, and people were praising the Lord and shouting and, and giving God honor and glory. And... Uh, the preacher, the young man that was preaching, looked at me and said, Kenny, uh, is your need satisfied? And I said, no. And so he said, well, let's pray again. So we knelt down there. And we began to pray. And uh, he asked me, said, what do you need? I said, I don't know. But I said, I feel like a empty, dried up rain barrel in the summertime. You know, we had rain barrels. We caught water and used it for the wash. And I said, I feel like an empty rain barrel, just dried up. And I said, I'd like for God to come and fill me afresh. And, uh, and the Lord just done exactly that, exactly that. During that time of prayer, as I was praying, uh, this young preacher was guiding me, and he said, he said just, just give God everything. Just give God everything everything. Well, I'd already come and accepted Christ as my Savior, but the idea and the thought of giving God my life had never, consciously at least, had never entered my mind. Giving God my life, not just offering up myself to, to live for Him and to be a Christian and to walk in His ways, but to give God my life. And I remember as I was praying, that thought come to me. I, I did not know at that time, but the scripture that said that present your bodies as a living sacrifice only acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I did not know that scripture then, but that's exactly what I did. I offered God, 
I did not, I was not convicted. I, he asked me, are you conscious of any sin? I said, no, I'm not conscious of no sin. And he said, well, you need a filling of the Holy Spirit. And, and so I began to pray. And as I did, and as I, I consecrated my life, I said, Lord, I'll give you my life. And as I was praying, and we prayed for quite a while, but as I was praying, the thought come to me, would you preach if I called you? I remember that distinctly, very distinctly. Would you preach if I called you? And to tell you the truth, it frightened me. It just absolutely frightened me. I, I, was, uh, I was one of these people, I got through high school without ever having to give a presentation. I was conveniently absent or sick. I was, uh, I never, I never, I never had to give a presentation when I was in high school. And I did, I did recite some things, you know, they had you memorize things for programs, but you know what I mean, get up and and give a presentation. And it, it, as I said, it frightened me. But then the thought come to my mind, God didn't ever call you to preach anyhow. You might as well go ahead and dedicate to it. Because God not, God's not going to call you to preach. And, uh, but that was the first conscious thought I had of preaching. And I, I dedicated my life to God that night and had... A wonderful experience in the Lord. God witnessed to my heart that he accepted my offer to him and that he accepted it and he, he blessed me with, well, what we know if you've had experiences like that, refreshing. But from that night on, for the next several weeks, I thought of nothing but about preaching. And all there was about Oh, probably four or five weeks it went on. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, I went to the altar. I had one question. Lord, is this, is this really you? Do you really want me to preach? And uh, without going into a lot of detail how that all worked out, God assured me. I've said this on other occasions. Uh, God might have made a mistake, but I have no doubt that he called me to preach. None. I mean, it was absolutely a positive witness to my heart and mind. And I, I'll not go into the details, but I become convinced. And then I accepted my call one night. I come to the altar and I was praying and accepted my call. I said, God, I will preach your gospel. And the Lord again blessed me with a tremendous refreshing of his spirit, lifted my heart and filled my heart with his joy and his blessings. And I got up from that altar and, and my pastor was standing at the pulpit. The, you know, it was the end of the service, Sunday evening. And uh, I, I went running to him and his eyes got real big. I don't know, he probably thought this boy lost his mind. But I went over and I picked him up and I went around and around with him. He wasn't too big of a fella anyhow. But I, I thank God that he called me to preach. Another favor I received from the Lord was the Bible said that whoever finds a wife is favored by God. And God favored my life by given me the wife that I have. Uh, she's proved that she loved me. You know, in our vows, we say for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, and we've experienced that. The better and the worse, and the richer and the poor. We've experienced all that. And, you know, to find true love is a wonderful thing. To find true love. So many people are not finding that. But I thank God that he favored me with that. We have a friend that uh, uh, sometime back they were 
just a short time ago, they were celebrating their uh, anniversary, their first year. They've been married for one year. And she posted that by saying, we have now been married for 365 days. You know? <laughs> and uh, that, that sounds a whole lot more than one year, you know, 365 days. So I calculated it. And this December the 14th, which is about 12 days from now, I will have been married 22,645 days. And that's counting the leap year as well. If you want, if you want to be blessed, serve God. If you want to be blessed, serve the Lord. Serve Him when you're young. Serve Him before you have sown things that you're going to reap the rest of your life. Serve Him before you have gone into things that that just, just, I, I've seen people just, just they, they, get, they get over it, but they never get out of it, really. You know, they, they just have messed up their life so bad. And uh, I thank God that he saved me when I was young. I'm going to read our passage and make a few comments here. Father, help me. Help me to be brief. I just have a few thoughts on my heart. I could go on and testify, but I thank you for your favor, your goodness, and your blessings. Now, help me, Lord, and I'll give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3. I begin reading verse number 8. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them and they declare their sins as Sodom. They hide them not. Woe unto their souls for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye unto the righteous that it shall be well with him for he shall eat the fruit of his doing. Woe unto the wicked for it shall be Ill, uh, Ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. In the context of this, and I'll not go into it, but Isaiah was describing, my friend, the then present moral condition of Judah. At this time, uh, Israel had already been taken into captivity, and Judah was uh, uh, going to go that way very soon. And both the leaders and the people, my friend, had become morally degenerated. And this passage brings out a, a truth, my friend, that is foundational to the message of the Bible. And that is that by living righteously, it'll be well with us. And by living, my friend, in sin and in wickedness, it will be ill. Both righteousness and sin have a cause and effect nature about them. Righteousness has a cause and effect. Sin has a cause and effect. And somebody said, what do you mean? Well, if we obey God's laws, then, my friend, we can expect positive uh, circumstances and consequences. I should say consequences instead of circumstances. But if we obey God and love Him and serve Him, we can expect positive consequences. But... If we live outside of the boundaries of God's law, don't be surprised, my friend, if we or if you experience negative consequences. Don't be surprised if things don't turn out well. Don't be surprised if things don't turn out good for you. The fallen condition of these folks is expressed in verse number 8 in both their words and their actions. It said, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen, and he meant ruined morally and spiritually and fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. Here is speaking about both their words and their actions. Their rebellion against God was 
manifested in that way, both, my friend, by their words and by their actions, the things that they were saying and then the things that they were doing. And this rebellion that was in this time of Isaiah, they were expressing their rebellion in a defiant way, defying God to his face. And then ninth verse said, The show of your countenance does witness against them, and they declare their sins like Sodom, and they hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. First he says here, the show of their con con countenance. And that simply means, my friend, the look on their face. Your face tells you a lot about your attitude, what you're thinking, and... Uh, my friend, what, you're, what you intend to do. And actually, this passage is referring to the brazenness of their, the brazenness of their sins was expressed in their, their very face, their countenance. They were stubbornly pursuing, my friend, rebellion against God. And then it says here, they declare their sins as Sodom and they hide them not. That simply means they were sinning openly, they were not hiding them. They were just sinning openly right in the face of God and very brazenly. And my friend, they were, so to speak, parading their sins like Sodom. <laughs> well, there's some counterparts to that today. Parading their sins like Sodom. Their brazenness and sin brought evil or disaster upon themselves. What he says here, woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Sin has its own way of punishing you. Paul tells us that in, in Romans. He talks about people uh, doing things that... that uh, homosexual activities and so on and he was saying that they they were bringing that destruction upon themselves and you know I, I'll just tell you this that people suffer from sin there's no question about that but they have no one to blame but themselves they have no one to blame but themselves now, in the midst of all of this, and this is what I wanted to bring to you, in the midst of all of this, God had some words of encouragement for the righteous. I thank God that not everybody's unfaithful today. Amen? There are people, brother and sister, that truly love God with all their heart. They are faithful in their daily life. They're faithful in their walk. They're faithful in their speech. They're faithful in their actions. And they, they manifest that. And he said here, Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for, he shall eat the fruit of the, for they shall eat the fruit of their doing. Woe unto the wicked, and it shall be ill unto him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. Now this is a, this is a fundamental truth of the message of the Bible. This actually is fundamental to the message of the Bible. That for the righteous, say to him or declare to him and tell him that it shall be well with him. And to the wicked, that it shall be evil for him or shall be ill with him. And the reward of his hand shall be given. In both of these cases, God is saying here, this is actually the theme of this is what we call the retributive judgment or justice of God. That simply means that the reaping is in kind. The reaping is in kind. It's according to the seed. It's according, my friend, to what is sown. That's what the reaping is. And throughout the Bible, and by the way, I, I one time made a study of the passages that talk about reaping and sowing, and actually the majority of them is said to the righteous, to not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap. And it's a passage, my friend, to encourage, such as this passage was. A passage of reaping and sowing. 
but it was a passage to encourage the righteous to continue to live a righteous life. And we need that encouragement from time to time. Amen? Say to the righteous that those who do right are going to experience God's goodness, and those who do evil or those who do wickedly are going to experience evil. Isaiah declared this truth, and I know it's a fundamental truth, but it was a truth at that time to provide encouragement for the righteous. And I want to do that again here tonight. For the same purpose, I, I again repeat this old truth, and that is, my friend, that people reap what they sow. Keep on sowing to righteousness. Keep on sowing, my friend, the right thing, and in due season you shall reap. Now, listen to me. I know that in the short term, we don't always see this played out, right? In the short term, we don't always see this played out. There's a psalm, the psalmist wrote uh, in the 73rd Psalm, and I'm not going to read it all, but this writer of this psalm had a problem. And his problem was that he was trying to live for God, but he looked out and he seen people that were wicked and ungodly, prospering and succeeding, and he was having difficulty and trouble. And it, it, it proved to be a problem to him. And I, I tell you, friend, that in the day and time in which you and I live, if we're not careful, it can become a problem to us. That as we look around, it seems as if, my friend, that the wicked are... Uh, somebody said, where's God's judgment? Don't seem like that, that uh, the wicked are suffering anything, and here I am struggling and so on. Let me read just portions of this. This is, a, uh, if you want to follow, Psalm 73. First verse said, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such as of, are of a clean heart or a pure heart. Here he's stating a truth that he knew. He knew this truth. God's good to Israel. And uh, translate that into to what it would mean to us. God's good to his people. God is good to his people. God is good to those that love him and trust him. Even to such as are of a clean or a pure heart. God is good to them. But then he says, but as for me. And he's speaking about himself here. In this psalm. But as for me, my feet were almost gone and my steps had well not slipped. He's saying here that he almost uh, stepped out of the path. He almost slipped and fell. He was almost nigh to slipping. We would call it backsliding today. Third verse. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, that they are in no bonds in their death, and, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride compasses them about as chains, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness, and that's just an expression meaning they just had so much they were... The eyes were bulging. They were so full. They have more than their heart could wish. This is what he seen that almost caused him, my friend, to fall. He, was, he knew the truth that God's good to the righteous. He knew the truth that God was good to those that had a clean heart. But he almost slipped and fell because he envied the foolish prosperity of the wicked, he seen that they had more than their hearts could desire. And he went on to say in the 12th verse, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And verily, this is what he said, Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He said, What? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? When you see the wicked prospering and, and uh, just seemingly to having 
Well, having everything. And said, for all day long I have been plagued or troubled and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I shall offend against a generation of thy children. He said, if I, if I really said what was in my heart, I would offend God's people. I would, and the word offend does not mean hurt their feelings. It means to cause them to fall. Cause them to fall. And when I thought to know this, he was trying to figure it out. He was meditating on this, trying to figure it out. It was too painful for me. His, his thoughts were so painful. And he said, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. And he means here their final end. Surely thou didst settest them in a slippery place, and thou castest them down into destruction. What he's saying here, listen to me, I tried, I said it, and I just read this to back up what I said. In the short term, we don't always see this played out, that doing right, you experience good, and doing evil, you experience ill. But in the ultimate sense, this is foundational to the message of the whole Bible. That God blesses the righteous and condemns, my friend, the wicked. To live in defiance of God, my friend, is to reap disaster. In the short term, it may not seem that way. But in the long term, it does. And if not in this present world, but but sooner or later in this present world, that comes to happen. But certainly it will at the final judgment. I remember one time reading an article about civilizations in the world, ancient civilizations. And this man that wrote this book, I forget, I think he said that there have been 80 great, uh, don't hold me to that number, but he said there have been so many a uh, certain number, I thought, it, I thought it was 80, but great civilizations in the history of the world, at least in written history. Every one of those civilizations, every one of those cultures started out as a moral people and ended up, my friend, as immoral. And every one of them is nothing but, my friend, a memory on the pages of a history book. God, my friend, blesses righteousness and condemns sin. That's a, that's fundamental. That's fundamental, my friend. We need to remember that in whatever the short-term effects may be, sometimes as you listen or uh, read about all the events going on in our news, Sometimes it looks like God's absent. It looks like God's forgotten about us. It looks like, my friend, that everything is just going downhill and there's no hope at all. Sometimes it can look like that. It depends on who you listen to and what you read. But whatever the short-term short effects may be, my friend, the righteous will never regret their choice in the long term or in the ultimate sense. Never. When you stand in the judgment, and you're going to be there someday, there's coming a time, the Bible tells us, a day in the future when all of the created intelligent universe will be gathered together. And at that time, there's going to be Everyone is going to be judged. We're going to stand before God and give an account of our life, Paul says, whether good or evil. We're going to give an account. Now, I don't know exactly all that's going to be done and said in that day, but God has the right and the privilege to bring up anything in our life, my friend, that, that he sees fit to bring up. The judgment, in my mind, the judgment is to vindicate God 
in his condemnation of the wicked. It's to vindicate God and show that anybody and everybody that goes to eternal damnation deserves to go there. Everybody and anybody that goes to hell deserves. They, can, they can't blame anybody but themselves. They have themselves to blame for their, well, their judgment. Someday out of that crowd, I'm going to hear the voice say, Kenneth Edward Yoder. And I don't know how, there may be a dozen of us or <laughs> more. I don't know how God is going to, to identify me, but I'm going to be identified. And out of that mass of humanity, I'm going to make my way to the judgment throne of God. And I'm going to stand there in my life. Whatever, whatever God intends to bring up, there may be unresolved conflicts that need to be dealt with. There may, I don't know what God, God has the privilege and the right to do whatever he wants to do. My only hope at that time is going to be Jesus' words. He's in the book of life. He's one of mine. That's my only hope. But you someday are going to be brought. And the whole intelligent created, uh, intelligent created universe, angels and men, are going to hear your judgment. And there's going to be enough said and enough exposed that if you are saved and trusted in Christ, that will be made known. But if you haven't, that also is going to be made known. Our culture has forgotten this truth. Our culture has forgotten that all sinning is self-destructive. Man, if we continue on this path of sin, it's going to lead to self-destruction. It can't have a society that's not built on integrity. You can't have peace. You can't have, my friend, confidence in your rulers or in your government of faith with, with all kinds of corrupt. You cannot have peace if people do not trust the judicial system. You cannot have my friend, it's going to lead to chaos. Sin is that way. Sin is its own undoing. It has its own reward. The consequences of sin are destructive. It produces confusion, chaos, heartache, trouble, sufferings. When God withdraws his blessings, either from an individual or a nation, my friend, he intends to compel them to seriously consider their sinful ways. I do not know what God's purposes are altogether. Only thing I know is that God has a purpose, my friend, to extend his kingdom into this world. That I know. That I know. But how God does that, I do not know. I do not know what the future holds, but I can tell you from history that God sometimes just lets people do their own thing until, my friend, they begin to reaping the consequences, and it's in the reaping of their consequences that they become an awakened. And I don't know that's going to happen. I hope it would be a better way than that. But God does allow sometimes, sometimes people have to be knocked flat on their back before they ever look up. Before they ever, before they ever cry out to God. Some folks are like that. Now, thank God, many of us here did not have to 
go through that. But God's purpose is to bring them to repentance by allowing them to suffer the consequences of their sin. To show them, my friend, this is not the way to live. This is not the thing to do. There's a vast, con uh, vast contrast in the Bible between the righteous, the hope of the righteous, and the hope of the wicked. In fact, the Bible teaches, my friend, that all things are working together for the eternal good of those who love God. You know this passage. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now listen to me. I'm going to try to help you. It's, it's so ingrained in people's thinking that this good means how they interpret good. You know, good health, good job, good home, good success. But this good that he speaks about here from the very context, this good where he said that all things work together for good, that good is eternal good. That good is our eternal salvation. All of us, even sometimes the righteous, don't have perfect health. They don't find their good in good health. Some righteous people, my friend, are sick, and some die from their sickness. Some, my friend, of, of God's righteous people have been poor. <laughs> right? God have chosen the poor of this world rich in faith. Some, my friend, have had all kinds of troubles and difficulties in life. Read the life of the Apostle Paul, probably one of God's greatest New Testament gospel preachers. He said that he didn't have enough clothes to keep him warm. At times he didn't have enough food to keep him from being hungry. And that's God's best man at the time, or one of the best. It does not mean the good here in this that's the man that wrote this. In prison more times than he could remember. Three times, I think it was, beaten with a rod. And then beaten with a, with a whip. 39 lashes, 40 minus 1. And he said, all things work together for good. What good is he talking about here? It's eternal salvation, that's the good. That's the best good. That's the ultimate good. I've seen people latch on to this passage of Scripture and say all things work together for good to them that love God. And they interpreted that good to their own thinking. And then they were disappointed because it didn't turn out like they thought. They didn't turn out like they hoped. It didn't turn out like they prayed. And so they begin to doubt that the Word of God is true. But that is not the problem. The problem is we do not understand what he's talking about here. The good, God works all things for our eternal good. What that means is that God, through his divine providence and through his Holy Spirit, he works in our life so that all the events of our life flow like tributaries into one stream that leads out to a home in glory. God overrules things that were meant for our harm. He overrules them and turns them into good for you and I. Well, I've got to go on. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, which is but, which, which is but for a moment. Think about that. Our light affliction. Here's a man... Can't remember how many times he'd been in jail for Christ. He can't, he was beaten three times with a rod, and I forget how many times with a whip and and thrown out of town, stoned. And then he said, My light affliction. <laughs> it don't look like a light affliction to me. But why could he say that? Because he put in one hand 
his afflictions. He put in one hand all the things that he had suffered for Christ, all the things that he had gone through. And in the other hand, he put the glory of eternity. And the, I waited so much. The glory. I waited so much that he called it a light affliction. <laughs> but for a moment, Paul never lived long enough to get out of trouble. He died by having his head chopped off. He was beheaded. They could not crucify a Roman citizen, and he was a Roman citizen, but they beheaded him. He never lived long enough to get out of trouble. And he said, my light affliction, which is but, which is, which is but for a moment. How could he say a moment? Because on one hand, he held time, and the other hand, eternity. <laughs> and eternity outweighs it so much more. We have a short space of life if, we're, if we are real fortunate, they say we can live to about 120 years. What is that to eternity? What is that to eternity? Paul said, my light affliction, which is but for a moment, work us for us. See, these things were working for him. It was working for his good. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. We've lost our eternal prospect of life. We have condensed our vision. We have condensed our thoughts about what life, the good of life and all that. We've condensed it down to our lifetime. But there's so much more good. Amen. Amen. And the second thing is that all things are conspiring for the eternal damnation of the wicked. Their successes, their blessings, my friend, will increase their damnation. Psalms 92, 7. When the wicked spring is grass. Uh, the spring is grass. If you ever sown grass, it comes up real quick. And what he's talking about here, sprouting up quickly. When the wicked sprout up quickly, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it simply means somebody who gets rich quickly and flourishes. It is that they shall be destroyed. The successes and the blessings that the wicked, my friend, have just doom them to destruction. When the righteous suffer, he can say, it's only for a while. It's only for a while. It'll be over soon. But when the wicked suffer for their sins, they will say, this is the only this is only the beginning of my sorrows. This is only the beginning. The longer, listen, I'm going to close shortly, but the longer you live in sin, the more ill it will work for your soul. Romans 2, and verse 5. But after thy hardness and impentant heart, and hardness means stubborn, impentant means one who refuses to, to repent, one who refuses to turn from their sins. But after thy hardness, stubborn, unrepenting heart, treasure up unto thyself wrath. And that simply means they are storing up wrath. Storing up wrath. Against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. As I've already mentioned, 
There's a coming day of judgment when the wrath of God is going to be revealed against sin in an overwhelming way. In the end, if you die and are lost and spend or go to a lost eternity, you will have no one to blame but yourself. That's what Isaiah meant when he said, and I'll turn there and read it again. He said, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Well, the word evil here means disaster. Evil in the sense of uh, things that are disastrous, devastating. For they have rewarded evil unto themselves. They have. They only have themselves to blame. The longer you live in sin, the harder it's going to be, friend, for you to turn from sin. The longer that you deny God, sooner or later, you're going to reap what you sow. And in some, some, and in some things, not all, but in some things, getting saved does not stop the reaping. My father, as I said, was an alcoholic, and he drank himself to death, literally. He was a hard drinker, drank whiskey, not beer, whiskey. In Kentucky, moonshine quite often. When he got saved, it didn't restore his health. It didn't correct all the ills of sin. In fact, he went on and went to meet the Lord because of that. I've seen people that have done things and, and then give their heart to God, but the thing that they've done, it, they just kept on reaping it. <laughs> the only way to stop the reaping is to stop the sowing. The only way to prevent the reaping is to prevent the sowing. Now, God does overcome many things, thank God. He gives us victory. He saves us. He cleans us up. But my, my point was here. I started off by testifying just a little of God's goodness to me. There's many more things I could say. But God's been good to me. God's blessed me and favored me with many blessings. I thank God for that. If you continue to live in sin, friend, there's no, there's no future in it. <laughs> there's no future in it. I don't care what you think you're going to get, what pleasures you think you're going to experience, how much better life is going to be. I'm telling you tonight, there's no future in it. There's no future in it. Sooner or later, you're going to begin to reaping what you've sown. I've seen people hide it, put it off for years, but then it come home. It come home. Father, thank you for saving us. Thank you, Father, for every righteous and faithful person here. Now, Lord, I wanted to try to encourage them. It seemed like it's a hard thing to do today, but to encourage them. In spite of the seeming success of the wicked and the prosperity 
and how the wicked seem to be flourishing, that it still is the best thing and the blessed thing to continue to walk in your ways and serve thee. I ask that thou would help if there's somebody here in this audience that has been tempted because of what they see around them. And they may have even asked themselves the question that the psalmist did. Have I cleansed my hands in vain? Have I lived a holy life in vain? Have I lived this Christian life in vain? Is there no blessing or future in it? Help them to see, Father, that they'll never regret, especially in the ultimate sense, they will never regret, Father, that they followed Thee. We ask it in Jesus' name, and amen. Page 150, 150. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. I know tonight, as I was preaching, at least I feel confident that most of you in this audience tonight know the Lord and love the Lord. I believe that. And I, I don't know whether you are tempted along this line. I'm shooting in the dark. <laughs> I, I don't even know who I'm aiming at. I'm just shooting in the dark. And I, I had a little bit of hesitation about preaching this, but that's what was on my heart. I know that most of you love the Lord, living for God, but I also know that one of the greatest battles we have in our day and time is discouragement. I know that. I know it without asking you or talking to you. I know that. That one of the biggest battles we have is discouragement. Discouragement in serving God and in the kingdom of God. And the way, the way that so many things have turned out. And I have some of them in my life too. I don't live in a foreign land or in a vacuum. I'm in the same battle. And I know that the enemy can come and say, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth the effort, the finances, all that you put in? And I don't know what you put into the work of God. And maybe you even have tremendous discouragement from your own family, you know? Maybe it's your children. Maybe it could even be a companion. Maybe it's a close friend. And, and you wonder, is it really worth it? I just tried to help you. And I know I didn't do a good job. I know that. But I tried to help you see tonight, it is worth it. It is worth it. The fundamental 
truth of the Bible is this, that God will bless the righteous and damn the wicked. That's a fundamental truth. It's from beginning to end. And I wanted to encourage you as God's people not to be discouraged, not to let your foot slip, not to get out of the path or stray from the way, but to remain faithful. And second of all, I know that it's possible that there's some here that do not know God. And they blindly are living their life in a dream world thinking that everything is going to turn out all right. And they're going to continue on in their pursuit of pleasures and happiness and various things. But they don't know what's ahead of them. Man, they some, my friend, that are making choices today. And they don't know where that choice is going to lead them. And I wanted to warn them, to awaken them if I could, to rouse them, to shake them, to see that sin is destructive. Sin is disastrous. There's no future in it. And that in a literal sense, I mean it. There's no future in it. The short term, it doesn't always work out that way in the short term. But my friend, in the ultimate sense, it always works out that way. Always. If you're here, and you're a child of God and a little discouraged, it might be a good time for you to pray. Say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for doubting your goodness, your blessings. Forgive me, Lord. And if you're unsaved, quit sin tonight. Repent immediately. Do it now. Do it now. Stop. Stop the downward path that you're on. Reverse it. Reverse it. I'm through. I'm going to ask Brother Romine to sing another verse. And then, Brother, you can close however you see fit. Let me add a throne of mercy. Find a sweet relief. be seated for just a few moments till these burdens are lifted. Could I have